Uh, but thanks everybody. Um, and my topic today is just a quick research update, you know, what's happening in the coolest drainage plots in Minnesota. Um, and I can claim that because we are really far north. <laughs> I put a star there on this map just for those of you who are not familiar with uh, kind of Minnesota geography. Um, you know, we are all the way up on the northwest corner of the state and um, we're in the Red River Basin, which actually our water flows north into uh, Lake Winnipeg um, across the Canadian border. So I can't claim that I'm the coolest drainage plots in North America because there are, uh, <laughs> there are some folks in Manitoba who've got some drainage plots too. Uh, but I just, you know, but that's, but I can make that claim uh, for Minnesota. Um, and, you know, we also are we're really cold up here. This is uh, just some snow. This is not current. This is, uh, this is from, I think, March of a year ago, um, just kind of showing some of the snow. And, and that really adds some, some interesting uh, complexity to uh, looking at drainage research because we, we really honestly have six months of winter uh, up here. And, uh, you know, and then, but, but the drainage uh, drainage still happens and drainage is still really needed uh, for the agriculture up here because we've also got um, heavy clay soils, uh, glacial lake bed soils similar to other parts of the country. So um, to catch everybody up, I have some new drainage plots uh, up here at the Northwest Research and Outreach Center. Those of you who uh, attended the drainage research forum last year, I went through kind of a quick update of the design that we have and kind of that planning process. Um, but I know that since we have so many more people online today, um, just to catch you guys up, um, this picture was taken um, October of 2019. Uh, we had a extremely wet fall and it was so wet in fact that they delivered the drainage pipe and they were ready to run it anytime, um, but it was too wet to actually tile the field. So um, that was just kind of one of those like unexpected, um, unexpected hangups for this drainage project, but, but really interesting, you know, and you can see the drain tile out here, but you know, the standing water in the field that was preventing us from actually installing that, um, yeah, just at the end of the year. But we did finally get it in, um, not without some, some really major disturbance to the soil. Um, this, this, photo is really good because it shows the drainage plow, but it also shows the tractor pulling the drainage plow to keep it from getting stuck in the mud. Um, so I think there's really no doubt that this field could use some drainage, uh, but, but yeah, this was, this was a big challenge and, and really led to some pretty big disruptions of the soil. And, um, you know, so I think that's going to be one of our interesting research questions moving forward. How long does it take um, to recover from that? So our overall design, um, it's just an overhead shot from, from Google. Um, the Northwest Research and Outreach Center is up um, kind of at the top. And we are adjacent to the University of Minnesota Crookston campus. Um, but we actually own a lot of the land um, in the University of Minnesota system. We own kind of all these fields. And, uh, and so when I drained this field, I had the opportunity to really take a look at a big scale project. Um, what we did is we took a 60 acre field that's kind of down in this corner right on the edge of town. Um, so right across the street from some, some uh, houses and kind of one of the bigger developing neighborhoods in town. We divided that field into four sections. Two of them uh, we ran tile lines for uh, 50 foot spacing, uh, three feet deep kind of standard uh, for this region. Um, and the other two we left undrained. And I know that it's not going to be perfectly, you know, drained versus undrained, um, you know, just based on the change in the hydrology. But, um, but we were really interested in kind of looking at the differences, especially when you take into account, you know, we were driving that heavy machinery on the field, the compaction, um, those sorts of things, um, you know, as, as we look at the data. And um, and we also have two lift stations. And in one of the later photos, you'll be able to see them. One lift station um, pumps out uh, the, the subsurface tile lines and the other lift station pumps out our surface stitches. So we have sort of a network of drainage here. We've got some um, kind of deeper cut um, surface drains in addition to our tile drainage that's already out there. 
Um, and that's again pretty common for this region. We don't have a big deep ditch uh, to outlet into, so that makes the um, the, the lift station a necessity. But what's also kind of nice about the lift station is that it'll make it really easy to do controlled drainage on the field uh, later on. So, you know, for future projects. So what's happening out there now? Um, you know, this year was, was obviously has been unlike any other, but we have still been out in the field collecting data, doing a lot of work. So some of the research questions that we're looking at, um, really that first one that I mentioned before, how long will it be until the soil sort of recovers or kind of reaches that quasi equilibrium um, after that major disruption from uh, our tile drainage installation? Um, the second question, how is nutrient cycling um, changed or altered by adding this drainage and changing the water movement um, in the soil profile. Um, and, and again, these are kind of two maybe more, more I guess you would say maybe basic questions uh, for drainage, but drainage is really pretty new to this region. And even though these questions have been answered in other parts of the country, there's still a lot of questions, you know, when you add that super cold climate variable into these soils, you know, how, how is the system going to respond? Um, and then finally, our last question is kind of a more longer term question. Um, can we improve nutrient use efficiency with for our nutrient management on these plots? And, um, and I will also say that these uh, farm fields, they're farmed uh, by our uh, by our folks at the Northwest Research and Outreach Center. And, um, and so we have a um, so we have actually really good control over, over what practices are going to be happening, what nutrient management is going to be happening. And we've got a good record, too, of, of what's been going on out there. So, so we'll kind of get a nice long-term uh, agronomic record of how uh, drainage has changed or not changed uh, operations out there. So our research questions, um, you know, I just wanted to show we don't have a lot of data yet because we've collected a lot of data, um, but have not had a chance to analyze it yet. So real quick, I'll just kind of show you some pictures of what we did out there uh, this summer. Uh, this again is the is the lift stations. This was a uh, field was planted into soybeans. Um, but then you see the, the lift station that's running um, that drains the tile drainage system. And you can see the surface drainage system is not currently running, but you can see as you look down the field um, into those kind of yellow, yellow surface inlets here. So you can kind of see the, a little bit more of the setup here. And we're looking at loss of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus in drainage water. We're also looking at the transformations of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus in the soil. Um, and these are just some, some pictures of, uh, you know, the grad students we have working on the project and a couple of undergrads, and they were really helpful in kind of getting this thing uh, sampled. You know, 60 acres is, is not, a, <laughs> it's not no small feat. So this is just some pictures of us uh, doing soil sampling. And finally, we're also looking at movement of carbon and nitrogen into the atmosphere. We're looking at greenhouse gas sampling on these plots as well. And uh, to do this, uh, you basically trap the emissions from the soil into these kind of like PVC uh, capped uh, pipes. And they're just pounded a little ways into the ground and you sample every 20 minutes and then you can get a picture of, of how uh, things are changing um, from the, how gases are emitted from the soil. And like I mentioned, we're still analyzing the data, um, but we have um, some really great projects coming down the line. Um, you know, our grad student projects are looking at phosphorus loss and soil health metrics. Uh, looking at changes in organic matter following subsurface drainage installation, and finally looking at nitrogen cycling efficiency and fertilizer needs uh, in relationship to drainage. So we're going to have a lot of great data at some point, and um, we've got a lot of partners on this project, um, you know, and including our, our next speaker, uh, Marin, is going to be working with me on answering some of these questions across across the Red River Basin. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to really uh, quick acknowledge uh, those organizations that, that really believed in my vision. So with that,
I'll turn it back over to Matt. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Lindsay. And in the kind of in the interest of time, we'll move to John's and then uh, we should have some time for question and answer kind of after after the next couple speakers. So I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Dr. John McMain at uh, South Dakota State University. All right. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, I think, Lindsay, that the phrase of 2020 is uh, you're on mute and I've done it too. I just about did it right then. So um, again, I'm John McMain from South Dakota State University. I work with uh, water management over a lot of different landscapes and uh, but work quite a bit with tile drainage. And uh, one of the things that that is interesting about South Dakota is kind of similar to the environment that Lindsay's working in is uh, drainage is, is relatively a new phenomenon. Um, when Dr. Chris Hay was here previously, it was really getting ramped up about 15 years ago. And so he and uh, Dr. Yaba Kiarsgaard have done a lot of really good kind of foundational, uh, foundational research related to drainage and drainage uh, practices, conservation drainage, but there's still a lot of questions. And one of the questions uh, to me is about the baseline. What's the baseline of water quality and kind of the quantity that we're looking at in tile drainage? So uh, with any good song, you have to have a baseline. And so uh, the classic under pressure, not the vanilla ice version, but it starts with the baseline and every the whole song builds off of that baseline. And so similar to uh, any good classic song for any type of water quality research, you need a baseline. Um, and so if we think about it from the music perspective, you have different pitches, which could be like concentrations, high and low. You have different durations, um, which would be the flow duration. And then you have kind of different um, levels, which would be the, the flow rate. And so we don't have necessarily a baseline um, of what is in, what's coming out of tile in South Dakota. Uh, we know a lot related to tile drainage water quality from many other states. Um, in fact, many other states have done comprehensive nutrient reduction plans or strategies, but South Dakota is not Iowa. It's not Illinois, it's not Indiana, it's not Minnesota, it's not even North Dakota because a lot of the drainage in North Dakota is in the Red River Basin. And so um, that's kind of been a project that, that we've been getting going is just what is the baseline for water quality and quantity in tile drainage in South Dakota. And then from that, we can uh, build on that. We can build our song, we can build our program, we can build a way to uh, manage drainage in a way that kind of harmonizes different, uh, different maybe competing interests, different perspectives. And so some of the things we're looking at, and this is a project funded by the South Dakota Nutrient Research and Education Council. Um, and what we're looking at is kind of what is, first of all, the nutrient concentration? Uh, when does it flow? What's the flow rate? And then those two things combine to make a, a load mass flow rate. And then um, how quickly do things change? So a lot of the assumption is that that nitrate concentration is is pretty consistent and, and we have seen that, but we've also seen some things that it can change within, um, so we've seen from, from 10 to 20 within a week or two weeks uh, parts per million time. And then there's a lot of other variables. There are so many variables. In fact, uh, Iowa Soybean Association is working on a project where they're doing something very similar. And uh, it's really hard to tease out what drives nutrient loss. And one of the predominant things that drives nutrient loss is precipitation. So just how much rainfall you get and how that drives nutrient loss. But so we wanna look at any of the variables that could potentially affect this to then um, prioritize where we put in management and how we can optimize um, investment in, in edge of field practices or otherwise. And so our baseline that we're setting is basically concentration, flow volume, um, and mass loss. So how much nitrate or phosphorus are we losing um, from tile across eastern South Dakota? From that, we can determine the factors that 
affect nutrient loss. So get into those different variables. And simultaneously, um, we're looking at different practices. So bioreactors, saturated buffers, controlled drainage. And so with those, those two kind of mid-level pieces, again, we can identify it, we can quantify the problem, we can prioritize investment based on particular risk factors, whether it's soils or crop or management. And then we can kind of the top right, optimize practice implementation. And so um, some of the farmers, well, really all the farmers that we've talked to um, have been very excited about this project. Whenever we uh, pitched it to the Nutrient Research and Education Council, I was a little concerned um, that we'd have a hard time getting farmers to, to buy in. But um, <clears throat> we've, we've seen that farmers are very interested for two reasons. One, if there's not much nitrate coming out of their tile, they want to know that so they can demonstrate that they're being good stewards. Um, and if there is a lot of nitrate or other nutrients coming out of their tile, they want to know that so they can change their practices to prevent that. So um, it is an economic piece as well as a water quality piece. And so that really drives it home. And so how are we doing this? Um, collect basically since there is so much variability and so many variables that affect this we're com connect collecting as many high quality data points as possible um, sampling tile outlets weekly or bi-weekly and then some we're doing more frequently um, plan to in 2021 with isco auto samplers and looking at concentration flow rate and mass or the load coming out and that's to get an instantaneous reading. So it's a snapshot of what's coming out. It doesn't tell you, you know, what's going on during that week, but we can look week to week or every two weeks to see how those are changing. And then we're looking at every variable upgrading of that or upstream of that. So the soils, the precipitation, the management, the crop, if they have any soil health practices, tillage, cover crops, all those variables. Um, and so it's a three-year project. And so at the end of three years, we hope to have you know, enough data points that, that we can tease out some of those um, variables that are risk factors, identify risk factors. And so basically what we do or what we've done is we've identified over 50 tile outlets uh, from seven different areas. So they're kind of grouped by area. Um, we've selected a subset of those to regularly sample. And some of that's just based on if the tile outlets, you know, without enough elevation to get a good height measurement, then that's not a priority outlet to, to sample. And then we have an additional um, probably five to seven farmers that are interested in the program in 2021. So we hope to add up to an additional 15. So up to around uh, 40 to 45 tile outlets that will sample weekly or bi-weekly in 2021. And so at the end of three years, um, we hope to have 150 out or 150 site years basically or tile outlet years that we've sampled weekly or bi-weekly. Um, so we did get to to start we plan to start in March um, obviously that's whenever the pandemic hit but we were able to start in June get some um, identify the kind of outlets we wanted to consistently measure and then sample in July and August and some in September. It was a very dry year in South Dakota. And so a lot of those uh, tiles dried up towards the end of the years. But out of 76 tile samples that we collected, um, we got some averages. We're still working through data and, and uh, still working with the lab to identify some uh, labeling issues and things like that. But on average, 14 parts per million for nitrate. Um, with a maximum 37, minimum of four, and then 18 of those uh, 76, so less than around 25%, um, were less than the 10 parts per million. And so um, finding harmony for tile drainage in South Dakota, I've been in South Dakota about three years, and I've talked to only a handful of people that, that see the middle ground for tile. Um, so to acknowledge the, the very real benefits to uh, crop growth, the potential for um, improving working lands so we don't have to take other lands out of kind of conservation. 
uh, and put other marginal lands into into production. So there's there's that perspective, and then there's the perspective of um, you know very real concerns about habitat and about uh, water quality. And so finding that middle ground, finding harmony, and to me it really starts with the baseline. What are we what are we working with? So that's kind of the first step. From that, we build on our baseline. There's a lot of research that we can take from other states, um, some things that everyone can do related to infield practices. And then once we've identified risk factors, then we optimize implementation for impact. So get the best bang for our buck. We don't need to put a bioreactor where the concentration is three parts per million um, and our load is, is very low. We need to put a bioreactor where our concentration is 20 or 30 or 40 parts per million. Um, and then I, I think I say this in every presentation, but continuing to innovate. So all of the practices that are currently in our toolbox aren't perfect. Um, they have issues, they either cost or they take land out of production or they don't perform you know, at a high level under all conditions. But that's not a reason to not use those practices. That's a reason to continue to innovate around those practices. So um, don't let imperfections be the be the stopping point, let imperfections be the starting point for innovation. And then um, drainage really, it must be implemented with all objectives in mind. And so I'm really glad, I, I feel like the drainage community in South Dakota and across the Midwest is very active and very, uh, it wants to do, wants to have drainage with all these objectives in mind. And so um, it's really exciting to be working in this space. Quick acknowledgement uh, just to the research team. And then funding for this project is uh, through South Dakota Nutrient Research and Education Council. And then the shameless plug, uh, so coming down the pipe, we've got a podcast that's set to drop in January. Um, and we're gonna be doing this in series with the first series being conservation drainage. So bioreactors, controlled drainage, saturated buffers, that whole uh, lineup of practices. Um, videos, we have, we've done We've recorded videos throughout the fall and working on editing and producing those. And then uh, we have nutrient loss calculator web app that's part of the transforming drainage project that uh, will will be up online soon. So um, and again, in interest of time, you can follow me on Twitter, I'm about 300 followers away from a thousand. So real close, but with that, I'll turn it over to Matt. Well, this is an opportunity to get some more Twitter followers. So anybody on Twitter, make sure you're following John. He does a great job of uh, documenting uh, the work that he's doing and sending out some good pictures. In fact, even uh, of the drill rig out in a on a nice uh, evening. So I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Lindsay Pease uh, to introduce our next two speakers. Lindsay uh, was able to, uh, to get uh, uh, Marin and, and Chad to present today. So I'll turn it over to Lindsay to introduce our next our next speaker. Yeah, and our, our next speaker is Dr. Marin McCray, and uh, she's a professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Management at the University of Waterloo in Waterloo, Ontario. Um, her research really focuses on how nutrient supply and transport practices processes interact uh, for nutrient fluxes and, um, and really looking at the interactions of climate and management on those. Um, and, um, and she's also, I'll also mention, she's also the lead PI on a pan-Canadian uh, agricultural, water, agricultural water futures program, which is looking at how Canadian agriculture can respond to kind of the risk and uncertainty of uh, climate change and other socioeconomic factors. So uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Marin and uh, thanks for being here, Marin. Thanks, it's a pleasure. Okay, I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, great. Yeah, so thank you very much. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. So today I'm going to speak about edge of field phosphorus loss in cold climates. I would just like to acknowledge my co-authors and partners um, because this has obviously been a team effort. Um, and it's not letting me advance. Okay, so um, really what I'd like to start with talking about is that many agricultural systems experience some sort of a winter period, um, certainly in the, the Great Plains, the Northern Great Plains, certainly in the Great Lakes region, and really across, um, really 
the world, we see a winter season um, in the Northern Hemisphere where a lot of agricultural areas are. And a lot of those systems, obviously, because you have that winter season, you're going to experience snowmelt. And we know that this snowmelt period can actually be quite important in our annual nutrient budgets, yet we really know very little about how phosphorus is mobilized during this period. We have some clues, but they, they're, they're from field studies, maybe in specific regions. And the reality is that sometimes we have differences in winter type. Not all winters are created equal. And I'm going to talk about that today. And in light of those differences, in light of those different types of conditions, the way phosphorus leaves the fields, the speciation with which it leaves, and the conservation practices that are maybe going to be the most bang for your buck might also differ. But certainly we need to learn to, we really need to understand these winter processes more. So today I want to talk about differences in the magnitude, speciation, and flow paths of phosphorus. And I'm going to be drawing on field studies between the northern Great Plains and also the Great Lakes region in Ontario, Canada. And, and I'm going to be talking about also the efficacy of conservation practices under these conditions, under these variable conditions. So the idea is that I want to move away from a one size fits all solution or explanation of how things work and realize that, that there really are some of these spatial differences and how can we use this knowledge to our advantage to make better conservation decisions for specific regions. And so when we look at uh, winter severity, this is really just showing you the northern Great Plains. So this is data that is has been collected in Winnipeg um, in Manitoba, Canada, and then the Great Lakes region at one of our field sites. So that's just um, in, in, in Southern Ontario. And so if we actually look at the pictures on the screen, these are all, we can, in the Great Lakes region, winter can look really like any of these pictures. Today, actually, it looks a bit like this and our kids are at home on a snow day. So if you hear interruptions during my talk, I really apologize. So um, annual precipitation, certainly in the Great Lakes region, we get a lot more than they do in the Northern Great Plains. But what's interesting, and, and that's unsurprising, what's interesting is when we look at the, the air temperature, so these are your surface temperatures in red, and then we're looking at subsurface temperatures. So these are, are a year of data a few years ago, um, and these are really looking at, say, maybe 30 to 50 centimeters, and these are maybe 20 centimeters or so. But ultimately, what you can see is that the level of ground frost experienced in the northern Great Plains is a lot less than we see, or a lot more, excuse me, a lot more colder temperatures, more ground frost than we see in the Great Lakes region. And that's because we really do have that insulating snow cover. We will get a complete and total loss of the snowpack, but then it comes back and that has this amazing insulation property so that we don't actually see as much frozen ground. So once you have frozen ground or an absence of, it's going to have implications for how water and nutrients move off of the landscape. So not only do we see differences between regions, we even see differences within a region. So on your screen, you can see the mean precipitation, air temperature, snow cover duration, and growing degree days for the Great or for the Lake Erie watershed. And then we also have mean annual temperatures and precipitation for the Red River Valley. And so even within these watersheds, we see differences in our climates where you can have uh, warmer and wetter regions, say to the south in the Red River Valley. Um, and then in the Great Lakes region, we, we like it's much warmer towards the southwestern end. And once you get into that northwestern Ohio and whatnot, but because we actually see a lot more snow cover in our cooler environment, we actually see less ground frost than they do because we have that snow, that snow insulative properties. So all of these differences are going to make, uh, make a difference in terms terms of when and how water moves off of the landscape. So add on to the climate drivers, the landscape drivers. So thinking about your slopes, your permeability. So you can have some of these very flat lacustrine clays, and then you can start to get more into these rolling environments, maybe some loams. So these things are all going to, again, impact. They're, they're obviously going to impact where drainage is used, but they're also going to impact the way that drainage behaves. 
So when we look at a comparison across these landscapes, we can see that most runoff and phosphorus loss happen with snowmelt. So if we look at our northern Great Plains on the left and the Great Lakes region, these are three sites in the Great Lakes region, I've put, put in this annual precipitation graph as an inset just in here to remind you. So certainly we get more precipitation annually, so it makes sense that we would also get more runoff annually. What's interesting is in purple, this is snowmelt runoff, and in light blue, it's rainfall runoff. Even though snow actually comprises a pretty minimal amount of the annual precipitation, it overwhelmingly dominates the runoff budgets, particularly in the prairies, but even in the Great Lakes region. So when we look at how water and phosphorus are leaving the fields, we have two, here I'm gonna talk about two sites in the Great Lakes region, one at the southwestern end in that clay plain, and another one in Midwestern Ontario, where this is on these rolling loam soils, which is what you're seeing that is on the, uh, in a, a site called in Lonsborough, which is about an hour and a bit north of London. And then lastly, we have a site in Manitoba, just west of Winnipeg. And so what you're seeing is in orange, you're seeing surface runoff, and in blue, you're seeing tile drainage. So as Lindsay mentioned earlier, there hasn't historically been a lot of tile drainage in the West, and that is something that is growing more and more. And so we were looking at the effects of tile drainage, or, or looking at in a tile drain landscape, how water and phosphorus were leaving the fields. So if we look at our Great Lakes region, notice that in both the clay and the loam sites, over Overwhelmingly, most of our water is lost below the ground. 80% of, of water leaves the soil, leaves the, at the edge of the field through tile drainage. But when we look at our phosphorus story, notice that the, the, the patterns are a little bit different. So in our clays, we again see that it's kind of proportionate. So certainly a lot of dissolved reactive phosphorus and not quite the same ratios of total phosphorus are lost. So the tiles are definitely an important pathway in this clay plain. But once we move into the loams, notice that surface runoff plays a much more dramatic role. So we are seeing buffering in the subsoils in these tile drained landscapes once you get into these loams. Now, when we go across to the prairie provinces, so this is our site that's very close to Winnipeg, a little west of Winnipeg, interestingly, overwhelmingly, most of the water left in the surface and very little of the water. So this is a clay site in the Red River Valley, but in the Northern River, Red River Valley. So notice that very little of our water actually left through tile drainage at the edge of the field. And the reason for this is because most of the annual runoff is associated with snowmelt. And what's happening during snowmelt? Well, there's about four feet of frost. And so the tiles were decoupled from those surface processes. You just had water moving over the surface. And so tile drains did little to influence the phosphorus story. And for, when you look at our phosphorus, overwhelmingly, it's associated with surface runoff. So I'm really excited now to be working with Lindsay and others on looking at tile drainage throughout the Red River Valley to see how, if, if we see more spatial differences in terms of how the tile drains may uh, behave with regards to the partitioning of runoff and phosphorus losses between the surface and the subsurface. So in addition to seeing differences in the flow pads, we also see differences in the speciation. And the, really, I don't want to go over time today. So the one I really want to draw your attention to is this one here. And notice that from a dissolved reactive phosphorus or a DRP or dissolved to total phosphorus ratio, the dissolved phosphorus plays a much greater role in the prairie provinces than it does in the Great Lakes region. So then you want to start about thinking about conservation practices and whether or not you want to prioritize source control or erosion control. And so in light of some of these climate differences, landscape differences, pathway differences, and, and speciation differences, what we might want to do across these regions may differ and one size fits all solutions are not going to work very well. And so most of what we know about agricultural conservation practices 
practices has largely been developed during the growing season. And we really don't know as much about the applicability of these practices across different landscapes and climate types. So I'm just going to talk about three examples. And so here are some studies. So this is in Ontario, this is in uh, Ohio, and this is in uh, in the um, Manitoba and or, uh, yeah Manitoba in the South Tobacco Creek watershed. And so what we're seeing in both surface runoff or in tile drainage, what we're actually seeing is that the higher your soil phosphorus is, the greater your concentrations of phosphorus are going to be, whether that's dissolved phosphorus or total phosphorus. Your losses are going to increase the higher those soil test concentrations are. And what they found in the prairies in a recent study is that at highly elevated sites, by drawing down that phosphorus agronomically, they actually had a significant impact on reducing phosphorus losses in snowmelt runoff. So this is really good news because a lot of the conservation practices that we might think we, we would like to use may not be applicable in more severe winters. And this is something that really is going to be effective everywhere. But we but there is obviously going to be a limit to how low you can draw down those soils. And a lot of people are working on those thresholds. Cover crops, these are something that's been widely promoted for soil health benefits, for certainly for nitrogen, um, biodiversity in your soils. Uh, so the problem with cover crop and also erosion control on the surface. The problem with cover crops is that when, they're, when they experience frost, and die, they have this frost kill, they lies, and because of that, they can release a lot of dissolved phosphorus to runoff. And so in some cases, some studies, certainly some that were in the Northern Great Plains have actually found that cover crops can accelerate phosphorus losses from fields. They're actually making things worse. And so this, of course, called into question, well, okay, does that mean cover crops are a problem in winter everywhere? So we did a comparative study. So we did some lab work and some field work. Work. So one of the first things we did is we subjected these different types of cover crops that are prevalent in our Ontario in our Ontario systems to different magnitudes of frost. So a gentle frost that you might experience underneath the snowpack or a more extreme frost, such as something that you might experience in a snow free zone or in the prairie provinces. And what we found is that the, the, the level of cover crop of phosphorus release following freeze thaw absolutely was affected by the magnitude of freezing. You really have to give them a good freeze before you're going to see that response. So that tells us that in more moderate climates, that risk is reduced. But if that risk is there, then you can optimize your species. So certainly tender species like oat or the radish, oilseed radish can absolutely release a lot of phosphorus, whereas cereal rye or red clover or hairy vetch, these are hardier species and they were able to withstand things. So we can optimize the species that we plant. The third thing that was important was the level of flooding that these experience. So if they tend to be inundated and have a lot of surface ponding, then the opportunity for leaching is certainly uh, from the plants is ab uh, absolutely enhanced. And so you can maybe optimize which, you know, the fields that you're using cover crops in or places within the field that you uh, plant or avoid planting these cover crops if this is a concern. So what we found at the edge of the field, though, is that even though we did see these phosphorus, this phosphorus being released from plants, it did not translate to, it was not observed at the edge of the field because any phosphorus that left the plants went into the soil through infiltration and was retained in the soil long before the peak snowmelt event occurred. So this tells us that cover crops are gonna behave differently and we really didn't see any impacts of cover crops on subsurface losses. It was really more of a surface thing. Um, the last one I'm going to talk about is tillage. So no-till, certainly in the Great Lakes region, there has been concern with the effects of no-till on phosphorus losses in tile drainage because no-till can increase preferential transport into tile drains and um, phosphorus uh, stratification in the soil profile. And because of this, 
they they no-till can enhance phosphorus losses through in tile drained la landscapes and so we did a study in some of these more loamy environments in the great lakes region and we found that tillage treatment did not impact dissolved reactive phosphorus losses through tile drainage although we did see a bit of an uptick in total phosphorus, so that particulate fraction coming out of the tilled landscapes. So we didn't see the same effects in tile drainage based on the soil landscape that we were in. But another feature was that phosphorus tends to be applied in the subsurface as bands at our loamy sites. And so actually, as long if you do no-till and accompany it with a subsurface placement rather than a surface broadcast, that can actually mitigate some of the issues associated with no-till and tile drainage and the phosphorus stories. Now, in the colder northern Great Plains, they found that tillage, because again, this was not in a tile drain landscape, but in the Are most... There? Yeah. Oh. Hello? Oh. oh. Keep going, Marin. I think somebody must have just... Gotten off oh, mute sorry. Okay, I'm just I'm, I'm just about done. So, um, in the colder no northern Great Plains, um, rotational tillage tended to reduce phosphorus losses in surface runoff compared to a conservation till. So, again, the effects of tillage are going to differ depending on where your land, where you're located. And so, I think it's important that we begin to optimize some of our recommendations in light of these. So. In our northern climate, snowmelt dominates annual phosphorus loss. Uh, runoff pathways and phosphorus speciation do differ with winter severity and landscape drivers. And uh, the F in light of and, and we also see differences in our phosphorus speciation, whether you're worried about dissolved or particulate losses. And so the efficacy of conservation practices is also going to differ across these regions, and our recommendations should reflect these differences. We often tell people to stack BMPs or stack their conservation practices to do as much as they can. But we have to remember that every time we ask them to do something, it's associated with cost and risk. And there are going to be limits to the amount of things that people are going to do. So if we're going to be able to get them to do a couple of things, we want to make sure that they're doing the things that are going to be most appropriate to their landscape of interest. And with that, you can see my contact information on screen. And I'm also on Twitter at Marin M. I'd like to thank my partners and funding agencies and thank you all for your time today. Excellent, thanks, Marin. Um, we do have time for maybe one quick question before we move on to our next presentation. Does anybody have a burning question? Otherwise, we do have time for, for questions at the end. Okay, not hearing any, um, <laughs> thanks. Oh, okay, somebody just typed one in chat. <laughs> Um, question for Marin, uh, where cover crops were yielding phosphorus transport, were those fields subject to long-term treatment of cover crop or was it a recent switch to cover crop use? I cannot, the ones that were yielding phosphorus transport, these are actually um, Jane Elliott and David Lobb sites. And I unfortunately can't answer that question. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know, but I will follow up with you. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I that's something I haven't thought about before. Yeah, but yeah, know, it's a great long, question. That's a really good question. Okay, well, in the interest of time, I guess you know I'll go ahead and we can get um, a couple. We'll save Mark's question for uh, for after. Um, I'll go ahead and start introducing our next speaker. Um, this is Dr. Chad Penn. Um, and Dr. Chad Penn is a research soil scientist at the USDA uh, Ag Research Service Natural, National so Soil Erosion Research Lab in West Lafayette, Indiana. Um, and before joining ARS, he was a professor of soil and environmental chemistry at Oklahoma State. 
Um, and he is perhaps best known uh, for his research into uh, the design and, and efficacy of field scale phosphorus removal structures. And since we have extra an extra couple of seconds here, um, fun fact, uh, Chad and I, the first time we were, we were chatting, found out we are both from the same very small region at the edge of the Allegheny Forest in Pennsylvania. So <laughs> it really is a small world where they don't have any child drainage at all over in that part of Pennsylvania. <laughs> they have lots of acid mine drainage, though. That's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank, thanks, Lindsay. Uh, thanks you for inviting me uh, as well, by the way. First of all, can you see, uh, do you see uh, the uh, presentation or do you see the presenter's view? Uh, we see the presentation, Chad, so you are okay. good to go. All right, thank you. Okay, so fossil removal structures, I'm going to cover a lot here in a small amount of time, so I'm going to get right to it. Um, the, the, I'm assuming the audience here is not super familiar with them, so I'm not going to get into any, any great detail on them, but I am going to give an overview of what they are and how they work and where you can get more information. So uh, phosphor removal structures are targeted towards filtering out dissolved phosphorus, not particulate phosphorus. Particularly, um, they're, they're targeted towards getting dissolved phosphorus out of uh, legacy P soils, trapping it from uh, soils uh, that have at least 100 milligrams per kilogram of malic 3 phosphorus. They are not intended to trap dissolved phosphorus coming off of fields that were recently fertilized or manured, we have, we have much cheaper best management practices for that. It's for the long-term problem of legacy pea soil. So uh, why are we focusing on dissolved phosphorus for this best management practice? Well, dissolved pea is a more potent eutrophication agent than particulate phosphorus. Um, one of the reasons is that aquatic organisms can immediately uptake dissolved phosphorus from water. As soon as that dissolved pea hits the water, they can uptake it and an algal bloom uh, can occur. Particulate phosphorus, that's not true. Their degree of bioavailability, uh, it depends. It depends on how much phosphorus is bound onto that sediment particle. Uh, it depends on the conditions of the water, um, the mineralogy of the sediment, uh, pea in the overlying uh, water column. So some sediments may actually absorb pea from the water column, others will desorb it, but dissolve pea, it's, it's always going to be bioavailable. So the, the recent re-eutrophication of Lake Erie has been attributed to increased loads in dissolved phosphorus. And the reason why the, the technology focuses on phosphorus that is sourced from legacy pea soils is because it is a very long-term problem. So uh, illustrated here, we have soils that were artificially built up to uh, different levels of malic 3 phosphorus, all the way up to 600 milligrams per kilogram, in which the phosphorus uh, application, the fertilizer applications was cut off. And then the, the soil pea was drawn down through a corn wheat beans rotation over a couple decades. Uh, and uh, what you can see is that, you know, even, e even with extended time, without adding any more phosphorus, the pea levels still remain high. They drop down, but it's very slow. So what they determined uh, when, when this research was, a pu was published just a few years ago was that if your soil test P levels are built up to around 300 or 400 milligrams per kilogram of phosphorus, it's going to take 20 to 30 years to draw them back down to agronomically acceptable levels. So uh, during, that whole, during that time, while you're drawing the phosphorus down, which is necessary, every time you get a flow event, you're going to lose a little bit of dissolved phosphorus. And that's why the P removal structures were developed were to um, act as a filter during that long drawdown period to capture that dissolved pea. So, um, you know, in theory, it's really simple. It's, it's a giant landscape filter, like a, you know, you think of it like your Brita filter. Basically, you've got a reactive media that has a high affinity for dissolved phosphorus. You force the water through it and uh, it retains the phosphorus and low phosphorus water comes out of it. And so the heart of it are the pea sorption materials. Now there's three necessary components for these giant landscape filters. They can be really diverse in appearance. I'm gonna show you a lot of uh, examples of how they can, how they can be applied, uh, but they all have to have these three main components in order to be a phosphor removal structure. First of all, obviously they gotta have an effective PSM or a phosphor absorption material filter media in a sufficient quantity. They have to have enough of it to handle a, a, an appreciable portion of the annual load and they have to be designed so that 
they can handle a sufficient flow rate for the site. If they can't, if the water can't flow through the media, then it can't treat the phosphorus. So they have to be able to handle a high flow rate and maintain a sufficient contact time. And last, you have to design these so that, that the PSM material can be retained, that you don't just lose it in flow. And also you can replace it later on when it, be, when it becomes saturated and no longer effective. So like I said, you keep those three main principles in mind and the structures can look um, pretty diverse. So we've built a lot, of, a lot of different styles of structures and I'm sure all of you can probably think of uh, some other interesting ways to apply them. But again, they all have the main, the, those three main principles. The materials that are used, most of them, we like to utilize uh, industrial byproducts that, that are uh, strong sorption agents for phosphorus. Uh, some of these include metal filings, steel shavings, steel slag, drinking water residuals, um, uh, materials, byproducts from coal-fired power plants. And then there's another category I just call manufactured PSMs, and those are uh, materials that are simply uh, made for absorbing phosphorus or things similar to it. And those tend to be very expensive, but very, very effective. Some of them are rechargeable. We'll talk a little bit about some of those. But in, in general, when you use industrial byproducts to uh, filter phosphorus, it's best to have them, depending on the material, it's best to have them screened for metals as well, just to make sure that you're not uh, causing a problem and trying to solve another one. So in, to aid in the design of phosphorus removal structures, we, we created a design software called P-TRAP. Uh, it's freely available from USDA ARS, Phosphorus Transport Reduction App. And as a user, you input um, several, uh, several, several key points of information about the site, the hydrology. You need to know what kind of flow rate you wanna handle for your site. Again, you gotta be able to handle most of the flow if you wanna treat the phosphorus, dissolve phosphorus. Um, you need to know something about the annual flow volume for your site, obviously the dissolved P level, how much air are you willing to give up? And then as the user, you have to choose a target. How much phosphorus do you wanna lose? You, do you want to remove over how much time? And you also need to know information about the P sorption material that you plan to employ. Um, what are the P-sorption characteristics of it? And again, needs to be screened for safety. Physical properties are important, especially when considering, again, you need to move water through the media. So things like hydraulic conductivity uh, are, are, and porosity are very important. So you put all this into the software and it spits out a design, a, a site-specific custom design for your site to, with your PSM to meet the goals that you specified, how much of your media you will need, what area it needs to be, how deep, and the pipe requirement for draining it. So you can find the software um, from the USDA. Easiest way to find it is just Google PTRAP uh, USDA or PTRAP National Soil Erosion Lab. Uh, it's free to use. Um, I will be, uh, I encourage you to use the help buttons on it. They are pretty, pretty useful, but I am gonna be posting some videos, tutorials on how to, uh, how to use the software um, whenever I get to it. Okay, so, Right now, I just want to give you a quick overview of some different structures, some different styles. But uh, uh, quickly, I want to say that, you know, if a site is going to be worth treating, it's going to require a large mass of PSMs. These things are big. They require tons of PSMs, not pounds. Um, you know, it, it would be nice. I wish I could stand here and tell you that, you know, we could use these, make these little small cartridge filters like what you see here and small modular boxes. But, uh, you know, because it sounds nice, you know, the portable, easy to install, but the reality of it is they really don't work. They don't work because uh, you can only put a very limited amount of filter mat material in them and they can't handle a very high flow rate either. So it's really not worth using them. Similar to the cartridges and small module boxes that don't work are filter socks. So filter socks, you know, they have the same problem. Um, you know, you've got a limited mass, you've got a very small mass of media. It's not enough to handle the load, any significant load at least. Um, they have very poor contact with water and a, and a very low contact time. I'll put it this way. Um, if it were that easy to treat dissolved phosphorus with these small cartridges and socks, we wouldn't have a problem in the first place, all right? So filter socks and cartridges, don't work. They, they, these things are going to be big, and I'll, I'll show you some uh, some photographs here in the next few slides. So currently, the technology it is effective. 
and it can be improved. But of course, I'm I'm always going to say that because I'm a researcher, and that's uh, that, that's, uh, that, that's 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 my bread and butter. So there's uh, we built a lot of structures throughout the world, um, monitored them. There's a review paper in 2017. You can check that out. We're continuing to build them more and make them better, particularly trying to improve their efficiency and reduce the costs. Here's an example. This is the style I call it a confined bed structure. It intercepts surface runoff. Um, here we have a bed of aluminum treated slag, steel slag has been treated, coated with aluminum. This is on a poultry farm in Eastern Oklahoma. The runoff from around the barns are kind of hemmed in here through these berms, goes in through these subsurface, these, these are these perforated pipes right here. Water drains down through the media and filters out down here. Um, so this removed 23% uh, of the 2.5 year load and it was still effective at that point. It has 40 tons of treated slag in it. It handled around a thousand gallons per minute of flow. It costs about $5,000. We built several of those, uh, built one on a golf course, uh, but ditch filters. So ditch filters are, are kind of like the confined bed, except you don't build a structure to hold the media, the filter material, the ditch holds it for you. So it allows a large amount of material to be used. Um, they're easy to build. So here you can see, Go back that you could here's here's the ditch before the media is put in you can see uh there's a, a bed of perforated pipe we also use a flow control structure to kind of hold the water back a little bit retain some some head on it then uh those pipes are joined together with a manifold it's back filled with media so you can see here then water flows down um infiltrates down through the media goes out through that manifold and drains into a larger ditch these generally cost less than $4,000, depending on the media that you use and how big that you, you, you want to build them. But you got to keep in mind, you know, when you're damming a ditch, they have to be uh, designed properly so that you don't uh, reduce the flow uh, excessively upstream, obviously. So we built a lot of these in Maryland and they worked okay. To be honest, we did not use um, the best media for it. We used a highly sieve steel slag and, and, and we also use flue gas gypsum. So in general, they removed about 25% of the cumulative load over two years, which eh, it's okay. We can do a lot better than that. But uh, again, that was, that, was, that was due to the, to the media that we were using. Subsurface tile drainage. This is probably what I get the most questions on for, for applying the, the technology to is filtering the water from a subsurface tile drain. Here's one that we built in uh, uh, Northern Indiana. It was, uh, we combined a blind inlet and drained a blind inlet and plumbed the tile drain directly into a buried bed of steel slag and the water flowed from the bottom up. It removed 55% of the dissolved phosphorus load, uh, the, the 1.5 year phosphorus load. We had 36 tons of normal slag. It clogged up though after about six months, cost $11,000. We learned a, a very good lesson from this about using regular blast furnace slag or electric arc furnace steel slag. And what we learned was that you cannot use regular slag for treating subsurface drainage. You can only use regular slag for treating surface runoff. And the reason why is because the bicarbonate contained in the subsurface drainage will clog your slag. So um, here's another example of a different style uh, bed, uh, buried bed, pyramidal structure for treating uh, uh, tile drainage. This was 30 tons of an aluminum coated slag uh, and we built this one with uh, Larry Brown in Northern Ohio. It was removing 40 to 95% of the dissolved P per event uh, after two years. Aluminum treated slag does work for treating uh, tile drainage, not normal slag. You'll hear me say that probably three more times. Blind inlets. Blind inlets can be phosphor removal structures if you replace the traditional limestone material with a piece option material. So, you know, normally you think about your prairie potholes where they're traditionally drained with a, a tile riser such as this, they're hick and bottom. You replace those with a blind inlet and use a pea sorption material in it and bang, you've got yourself a pea removal structure. This one, we use steel slag, which normal steel slag does work for surface runoff. And uh, we had a, about uh, 15 tons of slag. It removed um, in, in about two years, within two, uh, over two years, removed greater than 46% of the dissolved P load. It also removed a bunch of glyphosate and dicamba as well. So we, we, those, are, those are easy way to put a P 
funeral structure in the landscape. Some materials can be regenerated. This is one we built uh, with uh, 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 Margaret Kalsik and uh, Larry Brown uh, near Defiance, Ohio. Here we put the pea absorption material in a tank. Again, we're, we're treating subsurface tile drainage in this case. We used a manufactured PSM that was a iron coated aluminum mineral. And it was designed to remove 40% of the 10 year load dissolved fee. And then we designed it so we can regenerate it in situ, strip that phosphorus off of it and keep using it again. Uh, we are monitoring this one. It's, um, it costs about $12,000. Metal shavings are probably my most favorite PSM uh, as far as efficiency and cost. Uh, in a pilot box we built in the lab had about 300 pounds mixture of metal, uh, metal shavings mixed with um, gravel. It removed about after receiving 130,000 gallons for over a period of about six months, it removed 50% of the cumulative dissolved P load. And this material is cheap. So you mix only about 8% of the metal shavings with the, uh, with the gravel. Um, the metal is about $200 per ton. I get it from scrap yards, but this has the potential to be the most cost efficient. And uh, here's one we, we, we built uh, in the field last winter. We put it in a tank. Again, I don't always build these subsurface structures in tanks. Usually I, I reserve that for the more expensive um, manufactured PSMs, but this one we put in a tank. A lot of times I just like to bury them in a bed. So economically, you know, what do these things cost? They're not cheap. So again, you only want to use these on your hotspot fields. Uh, the cost varies from $3,000 to $20,000. You know, it depends on the size, the site, the peer removal goal. Uh, but the cost is similar to wastewater treatment when you look at it per pound. Um, if we use rechargeable media where we can strip the phosphorus, that cuts the, the, the cost in half per pound every time you, you regenerate it. And uh, we have a, a publication on, on, on how we uh, regenerate it. Metal shavings, again, show the promise to be the most economical. Um, we can build those for less than $10,000 for a typical structure. They have been used in Minnesota for er treating urban uh, stormwater. Some of you may have seen the work in the Twin Cities that uh, Erickson and his group have done, Doc Erickson and his group have done, where they mix the uh, metal shavings with, with uh, gravel and sand. Um, and so we're, we're basically applying that to handle much larger flow rates in an agricultural setting. So in 15 years of building structures, we've built well over 30. We're building more uh, every, every year. In fact, we, we've got some plans to build some with, with uh, a couple of professors at University of Iowa, uh, Dr. Sapir, Dr. Kalina, if I remember their names or pronounce them right, but we're gonna do some uh, uh, blind inlets that we're gonna use pea sorption materials. Uh, we've got some in, um, Oh gosh, Michigan we're putting in soon, other places, but um, we've learned a lot. Every time we build one, we learn something new. But one thing, I said it before, I'm gonna say it again, do not use regular slag uh, for treating tile drainage. Only use regular slag for surface water, otherwise it will clog. You need to use PSMs that have both a high flow rate and a high p-sorption capacity that have a low cost. So our first generation structures, removed a high amount of phosphorus, high capacity, but they couldn't handle much flow. Um, second generation was the opposite. They could handle lots of flow, high flow rates, but they only removed 25 to 50% of the cumulative one year load. Um, the third generation structures, that's where we're at now. We're building them with lower mass, less media, more efficient. Some of them are rechargeable. Um, we have we are building a mobile demo, demo structure in 2021 that we can take around and show people. There is a standard if you're interested in having one built, NRCS standard 782. Uh, there are a series of videos that we're putting together with NRCS and ASABE to train people on how to design and construct them. People can get certified on how to design and construct funeral structures. Those will be released in another year. There's a book where you can get more details on how to obtain the inputs and design the structures. Um, a special issue in the journal Water, it's open access. Anyone can look at these articles. This special issue is dedicated to mineral structures. And last, um, shameless plug, uh, Twitter. We, uh, I, I give updates when we're building a structure out in the field or any other things phosphorus related, but give thanks to 
some of my uh, uh, co-workers over the years, built a lot of structures and absolutely could not do it by myself. So Kevin King's group has been <clears throat> very helpful. Larry Brown, Margaret Kalsik, Nathan Stolfitz, Jay Martin and his crew at Ohio State, Justin McBride, uh, the Ohio NRCS, Aaron Hylers, Josh McGrath, and there are others as well that um, I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting. So um, I'll probably talk too long, but uh, we have time for questions. Uh, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you. All right, and Chad, you did not talk too long. This is great. We've got, we've definitely got some time uh, for questions, and uh, we do have some questions um, in the chat for you uh, right away. And so um, I'll kind of go to those first, and then um, then we'll kind of jump over to the questions that were for Marin. Um, We'll start with this one. Uh, what is the lifespan of the phosphorus removal structures? Okay, so that that um, it all de they're engineered units. So the lifespan depends on on how you design it. So you know, and it, it all of that really depends on the media. You know, so th the idea is to to, to pick, choose a media that will has the highest capacity to remove phosphorus, highest storage capacity that equals increased lifetime. And you want to get it at a low cost. What I always tell people is, I I design them for as uh, as as long as I can uh, economically, as long as economically feasible and practical. So again, that's that's one of the choices of the user when you design the structure. You choose how long you want it to last, how much P you want it to remove for how long. But um, you know, for I don't know, I'll give a generic site. Let's call it. 30 acres, subsurface, tile, uh, uh, treat, treating a, a main from a, from a 30 acre field uh, with soil test P levels of at, uh, around 100, 150 milligrams per kilogram. So let's say around 0 0.2 milligrams per liter of dissolved phosphorus in your flow. Um, I would, if I could use metal shavings at that site, I would design it. Uh, and let's say you're getting about, you know, typical site around I don't know, 4 million gallons a year, leaving that tile. Um, you know, I'll, I'll design something for that for at least 10 years, 40% removal. But some, a lot of those I'll design for, you know, much longer, 30 year, uh, 30 year removal at 40%. So it just, it depends on the site, how much dissolved P there is, depends on the media, uh, depends on the volume uh, leaving your site as well. But again, it's something you choose as a user. And we've also got um, probably two or three questions here that all sort of lump into one. And um, this is relating to kind of what you mentioned about recharging the phosphor absorbing media. Um, like what process do you use? Um, how do you recharge them? And then um, can you recycle the media if you don't recharge it and need to replace it? Okay, all right, great question. So. Um, the way we, we, first of all, you recharge only the materials that are um, iron rich. I put the PSMs in two main categories. There's iron and aluminum in one category because they have a certain P sorption mechanism. And then I put calcium rich materials in another category because it removes phosphorus by calcium phosphate precipitation. That's where things like slag, fly ash, and uh, uh, gypsum uh, are used. So you recharge the, 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 the PSMs in the iron aluminum category. Uh, and you generally strip it off with a hydroxide solution. So we use a potassium hydroxide solution and quite, it's really simple. Um, you know, we use a certain concentration of potassium hydroxide and a certain pore volume, and we just recycle it through the media, recirculate it through the media, media as it strips it off, collect that water, it's highly enriched in dissolved phosphorus at that point, so you dispose of it properly somewhere, you can apply it uh, somewhere. Uh, onto a soil that could use some phosphorus. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty simple. You just have to design your structure. And I only do this for expensive media. It's generally not worth it for a lot of the byproducts because you can get them so cheap. It's cheaper just to, just to dig them out and replace them. But for something, some of these materials that are manufactured and, and expensive, and I put in those ones in tanks, those ones I will recharge. So the, the materials that you're not going to recharge that you have to dispose of those usually you can just land apply. 
Um, they're uh, assuming that, you, that they're safe, that you're using safe materials in the first place. Uh, you can just land apply them. Don't expect a phosphorus benefit from from land application of a so, of a of a PSM that's set, that's been used to remove phosphorus for two reasons. One, the phosphorus is bound onto it really tight, and two, in the grand scheme of things, there's not that much phosphorus on it, <clears throat> and that's the same reason why when you trap that phosphorus and strip it off the media, it's not that much phosphorus. So yeah, it's great that we can trap this dissolved phosphorus and it can put a big dent in uh, nutrient trans and phosphorus transport eutrophication in that context. But in the context of how much phosphorus is required to grow a crop, it's, it's, it's almost nothing. So it's, that's, that's the paradox of dissolved phosphorus loss that we're faced with. That's the whole reason why we have, have one of the reasons why I have this problem. To grow a crop, you know, we need very, very large amounts of phosphorus. The amount that's leaving the field is tiny, tiny, tiny. You figure from our hot spots, we're only losing about half a pound of phosphorus per acre per year, right? That's not much phosphorus. Um, it's, 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 for the most part, it's economically inconsequential to the farmer. And that's like 50 cents, of, 50 cents uh, an acre or less, okay? But that small amount of phosphorus, while it's inconsequential in the agronomic context, in the environmental context, when it, that hits an aquatic ecosystem, that just a few pounds, it's devastating to a surface water body. So um, yeah, even though we can trap it and strip it, we don't strip it for the, for the sake of being able to recycle it. We strip it so, to save money so we can keep reusing that media to uh, keep trapping more phosphorus. All right, and one last question uh, for Chad, and then we'll ask uh, the questions for Marin. Um, if you're buying uh, iron from scrapyards, is it already ground to fine particles, or how is it processed? Yeah, so good question. So what I like to get is uh, uh, they're called metal shavings or metal turnings. I know there's some people here have had experience with. I know um, uh, uh, Dr. Hay, Chris Hay, has has some experience with that, but. I get them from the scrap yards, from the metal recyclers, and it's shredded. So they're real thin, and then, then they'll shred them for you as well. And it's real nice. It almost has like the consistency of like a pea gravel, you can, where you can sink a, a shovel right into it, just like pea gravel. Obviously not the same density, but it, it digs like that. And you mix that with your gravel. Don't exceed 8%. I've done that, and it will rust. As that metal rusts, and that's how it works, it oxidizes and produces iron oxide. And it's the iron oxide is what then absorbs the phosphorus, not the, not the raw uh, shiny metal, the iron zero as we call it. Um, so if you have too much of that, it'll rust too much, it'll clog your filter. Um, I get $200 a ton from uh, Omnisource in Indiana. You can also get it from uh, um, automobile uh, production plants, anywhere you got industry where they're making things out of metal. So I know in, in Minnesota, they've, they've, they've definitely got it. Um, <clears throat> Chicago has a very large source of them as well. We got some from, from the GM plant in Defiance for a structure that we built. But um, then there's other sources of, of iron that, that can be um, shredded up or um, uh, made into a sand size as well that's available. Awesome, thanks, Chad. Um, I'm gonna kind of combine these two questions for Marin too, because they both are kind of on the topic of, of BMP uh, adoption in Canada. Um, you know, has there been a push for strip tillage to place phosphorus in the row is kind of one question. And the other question is, are there many instances of cover crops throughout Canada? Okay, great, thanks. Um, I, I haven't seen a push to go uh, to strip tillage, I know that some are some are doing it. I think people are trying different options in terms of how to uh, basically where to put the phosphorus. Um, but I, I wouldn't say there's necessarily been a push to go to strip tillage. Um, and to answer your question about cover crops, I think that they are growing in popularity. But I think people are learning. Um, I think uh, I think that that I I don't I, I don't think I would call it widespread at this point. But they are something that is growing in popularity and is is be, it is being they are being promoted. So I do think that they will grow moving forward. Um, certainly, I think we see quite a bit of them in the Great Lakes region. Um, but but again, it's it's. It's definitely not dominant at this point. 
Yeah, that, that was kind of what I was wondering too. I mean, if maybe that cover crops would be a little bit more popular in like Ontario than say Manitoba as you get kind of colder and <laughs> shorter yeah. season. Yeah, for sure. All right, those were all of the questions that I uh, read in the chat. Oh, but another one just popped up. So that's good timing. <laughs> uh, what do you think explained the difference in proportional uh, soluble reactive phosphorus contributions to phosphorus leaching between your clay site and your loam site? Um, okay, so this is where you're talking about the, um, the partitioning from the surface, to the surface into tile. So I actually think that there's a, a couple of reasons because with regards to the soil test P at the sites, they are comparable. They're, they're basically the same. The only thing, uh, and the crop choices as well. And, and these are also like four and five year aggregations as well in terms of rotations. So it's not less necessarily that it's a single year. Like we're finding these patterns persist. And I think there's two reasons. One is hydrology and the other is biogeochemistry. And so in the, um, hydrologically speaking, we know there's a lot more preferential transport that's going into the tile drains in the clay than there is in the loam sites. There is a lot more water that's moving through the matrix. We do see preferential flow in loams, but it's not the same kind of preferential flow. Um, and then the other reason is that in the loams, we, we're actually finding that there is a lot more um, a lot more of the carbonates in our loam soil. So there's a lot more opportunities for buffering in, in those sites. So it, it's, you know, it's been interesting to explain to farmers, it's not necessarily that you, you know, if your tiles are not doing as much in the, um, in this sort of loamy rolling hills, um, it, it's, it's just that those soils tend to be a little bit better at buffering. But then when we start to think about the, about what we would do necessarily, anything that would, um, if you were to say block up tiles in these loams and, and if you if that led to more surface runoff, you'd probably be making conditions worse. So it's just kind of one of those things. So yeah, it's it's hydrology and the soil biogeochemistry itself. So it's it's two things. And I'll ask a follow up. This is just, um, you know, something that has sort of come up as we talk about preferential flow pathways. Um, is, is the contribution of earthworms, right? Um, mm -hmm. um, do you see the same kind of patterns of preferential flow um, in kind of heavy clay soils of the Red River Basin versus kind of those of the Great Lakes region? Do you have any sense of, of kind of if those are similar? Well, I mean, we're definitely seeing preferential flow in both landscapes, um, but at the same time, uh, I mean, certainly the Red River, we were looking there, so these, these vertisolic cracks, and you can see them as they go down the, the dark brown, the organic matter from the surface going down into those cracks. And so um, Kokalon Vivekananthan is a, a PhD student uh, that just recently completed his work with me. And so he did some work on preferential transport, and we definitely did see preferential transport in the in the prairies um yeah i'm just trying having a hard time figuring out how to answer your question whether it looks the same or not i don't know that we've done any direct comparisons but maybe that's something we should do um i do think that we do see it um i think that he saw it uh he saw it associated with heavy rains and summer on the drying and he also saw it in the winter actually with frozen ground so those were the things that would enhance preferential transport um, I think in the, the clay soils um, in more of the Great Lakes region, again, I do think you're going to see it with heavy rainfall as well. I think desiccation cracks are part of it, wormholes. It's hard to say. I think, I think there's a lot of discussion on whether or not dry, dry desiccation cracks and wormholes are doing the same thing. So that's, that's a nice topic of, de of debate for sure. Awesome. Thank you, Marion. And we are right at 10 o'clock. Um, so it is time for our first break. But you know, I just really thank you to Chad and Marin. Um, this was great presentations and some some great questions from the audience. And also thanks to the audience, you're all very well behaved. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, dropping your questions into chat. So a great group of people we have here uh, today. <laughs>